how do we want a player to break up with us? Uh, like, we could just kind of talk about it from our perspective. It's me. It's all me. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's what the player should say? Or that's what... Yeah, it's like, it's me. I just... It's not you. Yeah, it's, it's not me. you. It's me. <laughs> Welcome to Shankcast episode number 10. Today we're going to be talking about bad tennis lessons. <laughs> That's the title of the show. Megan, Kevin, myself are going to combine our, we just did the math. We've combined, we've been on the court teaching for 70 years. Scary. <laughs> How crazy is that, James? That's nuts. 70 years. We are teaching experience has an AARP card. <laughs> yeah, I feel like if we were the Power Rangers who combine powers, we would equal like a 70-year-old tennis coach. <laughs> With all the wrinkles yeah, and the, like... the bucket hat. <laughs> and the leathery skin. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to talk about different types of tennis lesson and try not to be overly judgmental. There's a wide range of different types and styles of lesson that you can take for different reasons, different purposes, different types of player. And so we're going to very hopefully clearly define that. Also talk about what bothers us the most about coaches, what you should look to avoid when you're looking for a tennis coach. Also, what, what are, in our opinion, you should look for in a coach. What are the most important characteristics that make up a great coach? And finally, we're going to talk about how do you change coaches? Because that's always... Dun, dun, dun. I've, I've received that question so often, and yeah. It's a hard... There's... From both sides. I mean, yeah, yeah, let's just talk a... about like how do we want a player to break up with us? Uh, like we could just kind of talk about it from our perspective. It's me. It's all me. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's what the player should say, or that's what? Yeah, it's like it's me. I just. It's not you. Yeah, it's, it's not me. you. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> it's me. Or real quickly before we get into the questions, first of all, I just want to thank everybody who did leave a review during our promotional period in September. The feedback has been outstanding and just want to thank everybody for all the kind words and the suggestions, the topic suggestions and the format suggestions and everything has been super, super helpful and really gives us a lot of drive and enthusiasm moving forwards. Uh, I think we're off to a really good start and it's just going to get better and better. Yeah. And if you thank have you. other ideas, definitely uh, send always, them in because yeah. we're always looking for ideas. And also, we now have the Shankcast available on Google Play, on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on Stitcher, and YouTube as well. So we're at pretty much wherever you could possibly listen to podcasts, you can find the Shankcast <laughs> worldwide. <laughs> All right, let's jump into it. So over, the, over those 70 years, Kevin, Megan, myself have seen a lot of really <laughs> great examples of excellent coaching. And we've seen a lot of terrible examples of, of awful lessons and everything in between. And so this is something we've just been talking a lot about in the office internally recently because we've had, I think what really kind of started, I mean, we talk a lot about other coaches and how to coach and how to teach. We do things in a very particular way for a very particular type of player. And so I think that's important to point out first and foremost is that like we're not super, I mean... As fun as it is to judge other people sometimes, uh, that's not like our, our goal here is to sit here and, and talk about why all other coaching is, is bad and why all other coaches are bad. That's not at all our personality or our mission or our you know, culture here at Essential Tennis. But there's a lot of lessons being given that players just don't know the difference between what is going to move the needle for them and what is not. And I think this all kind of started, Kevin, with the person, was it inside the forums? We don't want to divulge too much. <laughs> yeah. wait, wait, it wasn't an email. Well, it doesn't matter. Somebody sent Kevin a video of a whole tennis lesson and basically just asked for feedback, right? Yeah. We're not going to name any names here or location or any, anything specific. But watching that video, and we've watched others too, like recently, a couple months ago, we watched a lesson being given by like a world, like a oh, house, yeah. household like tennis name, like world renowned coach. We won't go into any more specifics than that. And there's, there's a lot of information being thrown out there and a lot of process being used that is, just doesn't work very well. So... 
let's talk about different types of lessons for different types of players first. I think that's really important to different define. Different strokes for different folks. Different strokes for, for different folks. Oh, yeah. Kevin, Megan, what styles, <laughs> uh, how would you describe the different types of, of tennis lesson? I think there's the, <clears throat> excuse me, the player who wants to go out and that is their exercise. Like that's what they're looking for. They just want, they want Cardio a, love. Right. They want to, they want a clinic style. They don't take a lot of one-on-one -on -one or personal type lessons, but they really want it. They like the cardio tennis classes and that kind of stuff. They want to look at their Fitbit afterwards and be like, right. Yeah. yeah they want to hundred steps. Right. Yeah. Exactly. That's, that's it. And that's not a bad thing. That's no. just, that's their goal. Their mm -hmm. goal is to use it for their exercise. And then I think there's the type of player who really wants to work on hitting tennis balls the correct way, like the correct tennis like technique and strategy. And so they're willing to kind of go backwards before going forwards when they go out on the court. And I think that's a specific type of player. Um, that is willing to kind of slow things down and they might only hit 10 balls a lesson or something like that in an hour. And they're okay with that as long as they are understanding how those specific progressions are actually going to develop their tennis game overall. And those are our people. Yeah, those are our people. And then you have, I mean, there's people in between. There's people who want to get another better. another specific, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Maybe you're about to touch on it. So there's people who, they want to get better. It's not like they don't want to get better, but they really are looking to hit a ton of tennis balls, and that's their belief on how to get better. And, and, and they're not willing to go backwards before going forwards. Like, they yeah. just want to make a lot of balls. And that's okay, too. Like, that's their... I would kind of break those into two separate categories. There's definitely the player who says they want to get better, but they're not changing their grip. They're not changing their, like, take back. Like, they're really not changing anything. <laughs> they just want to kind of polish what they've already got. Again, like, no judgment. Like, fine. Like, everybody has their different goals and, like, what they want to get out of it. Um, and I would kind of put that in a slightly, maybe it's a subcategory of the, uh, the other one that you mentioned was somebody who just wants to hit a crap load of balls. And it's not necessarily about steps. Like they just believe that the more balls they hit, the, the more. And, and I just want to clarify, advance. there are plenty of players out there that hit a ton of balls and they do get better. Now, do they reach their p full potential? Maybe not, but they do get better. Yeah, this is interesting. It could get lead into an interesting little bit of conversation we had in Hawaii about, I'm going to throw his name out there, David Goggins is a good coach, <laughs> which I'll, I'll bring in later. I think there's another mention. I think as we continue, I think it's really important to emphasize, that we're, you know, none of these are uh, like labeling in a negative way. We're just kind of breaking it up. I think another kind of segment is, which is a big segment, is the social butterfly, <laughs> meaning they just want to come out. They want to like hit with friends. They want to talk. They want to chat as long as they gossip can get the ball. Bit. Yeah, they want to yeah. gossip, whatever. As long as they can get the ball back over and it allows them to be in this certain group and, and have fun. Yeah. I think that's a that's a big it's like portion. It's like a peer group, like yeah. just kind of quality time, like yeah, spent together. Yeah, yeah, It's like sometimes you guys and women, you know, the guys want to go out and have a beer, play some dubs, and you know, totally. drink and just kind of bro time after. And the ladies want to like, you know, like talk about wine you know the, the, the the yeah wine and cheese and Lululemon and get it done. <laughs> so I don't think that's that's another group in there that I think is. Um, you say really that bigger. sarcastically, but you don't Dude, mean it. I like it. me some Lulu. I know. I'm I just like saying. Me some Lulu. I'm just saying it came off sarcastic, but no, he's no. actually being yeah, serious. Yeah, yeah. He's I'm, not saying yeah, yeah, yeah. it in a negative way. No, I love me some Lululemon, just like the ladies. So the, I mean, we just we just laid out what six, at least a half Five a dozen. Six, yeah. I feel yeah. it's like you have four major categories, and you have like a break off. You have the fitness cardio you have the technical i will go back to move forward you have the social butterfly lululemon and then you have the hip tons of balls into separate categories of my belief i need balls i would maybe also put break that category into three categories in the sense of hit tons of balls um because you're gonna get better just wants to hit tons of balls doesn't care if they get it better it's kind of like a weird cardio but i just want to hit a tons of balls and then you have maybe this might be a, another group the competitor who doesn't really care about the mm -hmm. technique they just want to compete they just want to go out and if they can hit a ball over however means they're like 
the win is more important than how they win. And they're totally out That's to going. like, yeah, mm-hmm. they're totally out to like, kind of like <laughs> shame you. You took a ton of, <laughs> ton of tennis lessons and I did, well, not the shame you, but the, the idea is like, they don't care about the tennis they lessons. They just want the W. They just yeah. want the W and they'll yeah. hack you, slice you, whatever you, yeah. they, to get it done. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, so it's six or seven, and I think it's, it's critical to understand as a listener, as a, as a player, that all of those different objectives to a certain degree are at odds with each other. Uh, and so you have to self-identify, kind of going into the Central Tennis Podcast mode, uh, you kind of you have to self identify like which of those categories do you most strongly associate with, and then find the coach that like specializes in that type of delivery, because it's a totally different coach that does the social butterfly social butterfly service than the the hardcore like I, I will go backwards to go forwards like service. I don't think that's necessarily true. So, yeah, this Sorry. is gonna be an interesting conversation. Because they're not mutually exclusive, but they're two totally different skill sets. Would you right, agree with that? But I think there's a lot of tennis coaches. I didn't that have... I didn't say a coach can't have both, <laughs> but oh. they're two different yeah, completely I, different types of service that Right, right, right. Yeah. Most but, coaches kinda have a specialty. R- it, I, I think it's a hard thing to blanket and say yeah, most coaches. I think a, I don't think you, either. Depending on I think depending on and we might have a skewed I, view. I would, go, I would go deep into that. And here's, here's this is the great part about this. I think we might have a skewed view, and I'll speak for myself because we've worked with a lot. We've had to do both. We've had to kind yeah. of. I've been in a situation where I literally I'll ask the person like. In, a, in not a direct sometimes way, but what kind of lesson do you want this to be? Do you want to work on something? And I have my preference, but uh, in certain situations as a coach where you are, you're providing a service and they're coming to you wanting a specific thing. Mm-hmm. And I think in some sense, and we'll get into it, what a good coach can do is provide the service that the person wants. Yep. Now, whether you believe as a coach that's what they need, they're coming to you and asking you to provide a service. So I think that's one key element of you know, well, also how you categorize the, here's the your problem. coach. All those different like subcategories of service are all called a lesson. And so when you go sign up for a lesson at your local club, the coach's like idea of what a great lesson is could be completely different from one coach to another to another. And it really has to be defined by the student, I think. Like what are your goals and your objectives? Because if you're not really clear on that with yourself, much less with a coach, then you might just end up well, being yeah, but that's, yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. The, that's yeah, what I'm that's saying. The it's thing like, is, the, the player, the coach, <clears throat> it's the coach's responsibility in my mind, and I think Kevin is too, that you walk out and you say, like, what, what is this? What's yeah. your goal for the lesson? What are we doing today? What is, you know, or if it's a, a student where you've already discussed goals, you've already discussed the way that you're going to have lessons. And so mm-hmm. I think it's, it's, it has to be clear between the, student and the pl- and the coach on what the objective for that lesson is and then it's the coach's obligation to make that the best possible situation for that exact player and yep. whether it be a player who's all the way on the spectrum of I want to video everything I'm doing and I want to work on technique or the player that's like hey I just want to hit some balls and play some points like you have to be able to do all of those lessons that's and how another do you, lesson how, here's, here's the question it's just though. like here's, the grinder just here, like the, the driller is another here's great something uh, I think is really type. important because we're, we're keep using this word how do we define a lesson because we're it's very interesting that this could be very skewed and it can really break up like this whole conversation of like, how do you, how do you define a lesson? I think it's super simple. Like one person with a tennis racket gives another person with a tennis racket some money and says, I want to accomplish this. And the person who received the money provides that. Okay. So we're, we're, I think we're all saying, unless you think differently, we're saying the same thing. Basically, the someone comes to the pro and says, I want something, whether that be to get better or whether it be a fitness lesson or a social type situation of a lesson. Uh, we're all saying that the customer is basically stating what they want as the goal. And we're as a coach trying to provide what they want. The problem is, is that there's a lot of coaches that can't provide all of those. This is true. And They're that's, all- that's, I think that's one of the biggest issues. Is I don't that- think every coach should be expected to, frankly, because Again, they, they require completely different levels of energy and knowledge and process. And you can't expect a fantastic social butterfly provider 
to all of a sudden fix somebody's waiter tray position when they haven't done that for the last five years because all they do is rotate through you know social uh, type lessons or drill groups and vice versa. You can't take somebody like me and ask them to teach social butterfly groups for eight hours a day and expect me to not hang myself <laughs> because like, so, I can do, I can provide that, but I'm not happy providing that. And I don't do nearly as good of a job at it as other coaches who have a very different skill set than I no, do. I agree with that. And I think that's where, which is a tough part on the coaches side and some club sides that some clubs put the coach in a situation where it's like, look, we need you to provide this type of lesson regardless of your personality. And, you know, I think that is a skill set. I'm probably on the shank cast. I'm probably seems very extroverted, very like vocal, but I'm actually I would say 65 to 75% on the introvertive side. It's a skill set that I have developed and have mm-hmm. learned to do. Uh, and Megan knows, I mean, I've, I've been in situations where I'll be put in that situation. And maybe it's not something I do, but I've developed the kind of raw, raw, like ability. And I am raw, raw. It's weird. Don't ask. But it's weird in the sense of uh, personality. But... I ha- I've developed that skill of being able to give that type of lesson if need to be. Like you, I'm, I'm totally in the sense of my, in, in my soul, it's like, oh, but I make the most of it. And a lot right. of times I do have fun because it's like, look, I also manipulate the lesson to figure out how can I make this enjoyable to me and them where they get what they want, I get what I want, and, and fix it that way. So yeah. I think, yeah, I totally agree that all coaches aren't, in a sense, that's a difficult skill to learn. And is taking a lot of time and being put in a lot of different situations from working in a, a country club style environment where it is like, hey, I'm put on the court with eight guys. Um, I have to know each one of their names. I need to say something cool to them. I need to get them going, get and get them moving. And that's what was required with me, uh, for me at that time. And then working with high level juniors where it's like, look, you need to develop this player yeah. so they can win tournaments. And there's a lot of different skill sets. I think w- what makes the difference is the coaches um, motivation to do one or the other. Some coaches aren't motivated to become that kind of exactly. coach. You can put me in any situation. And I think this right. is the coaches Because if you walk, you walk into the club and you see the lineup of like a head pro, assistant professional, blah, blah, you got your six coaches and it says ranked blah, blah, blah as a junior and went to XYZ like college and ITF, you know, yada, yada, yada. But nowhere in any tennis club in the entire world does it say, Social butterfly extraordinaire, or like you know what I'm saying? Like it does. You don't know like what that coach's like real strengths are until you get out there on the court and you like actually find out. But I think most students don't know what type of player they are either. I mean, and that's I I think one of the biggest things I always did with any of my adult lessons, anything, as I said, okay, what is your goal? Like I knew mm. every single player. But a lot of players aren't honest. They'll, they'll know and they're not honest about it. But if you play with them enough, you will know what their goal yeah. is. And so the thing is, is that there are plenty of players where I said, hey, this is what you told me your goal is. This is what's happening. And they aren't lining up. And so we either need to reevaluate your goals or we need to figure out a different change of I feel like of a lot coaches. of coaches just don't even have that conversation. But the, that, that, I think, is the biggest issue, <clears throat> for me at least. I think that is something I'm very, very strong about. I mean, I was specific with all of my students that I taught across the board. We sat down off the tennis court like at least twice a year and went over goals, period. Because without goals, I can't be the best tennis coach for them, and they can't actually see the improvements. But I feel like that in and of itself is like counter counter to the social butterfly, for example. No, I had plenty of people who no. di- who wanted that. Like they were like, my goal is to have fun. You actually you yeah. actually had people paying you for lessons 100%. who were like, hundred percent. My goal is the same as the last six months. I just want to laugh and run around. Yeah, they wanted I, to wow. get better. I'm actually surprised anybody well, would tell you that. No, they wanted to get better, but their biggest goal was <laughs> to play on the team. Like, yeah. they wanted to play on that team, and that was their goal. And I was like, great, that's your goal. I'm going to make it to where you can stay on that team. You know, when they start to move up or whenever, you're going to be able to be part of that team. And these are the things that we need to make sure that you can do 
so that you can make enough balls over the net and you can do certain things so that you can play on that but team. You just, and, but you just changed it again, away from having fun to playing on this team, which is a totally different conversation. Here's, I think, another thing to make, it's balancing between both. It's also how we're judging better. Because I think in our minds as a tennis coach, you can get down this road of like, if you're not making such and such balls, you're not getting better. If your stroke doesn't look like this, you're not getting better. And in their minds, they're like, I'm having a lot of fun, so I must be getting better. So I think that's a, a really hard, tough line to hope because you're talking about, you're asking about goals, Megan, and you're saying that like, you know, maybe it's a social thing. And you're like, hey, you got to make these balls to stay on this team. And they're like, hey, maybe I make one more ball. It doesn't matter about the technique. And I can stay on the right. team. I've gotten better. And I think that's, it's a tough thing to... As, as looking from both sides. It's a tough thing is because we get so locked in as a coach that you sometimes just see better yeah. as a technical better. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's our definition versus theirs. And I think for me, as we go in, and this may be segmenting in because I think we spent actually a lot of time on this first question, just <laughs> venting. It's the Shank Castle. Yeah, <laughs> is that what makes a good coach for me? And I don't know if that's the next question, is it? Uh, uh, a couple down is what should people look for in a coach? Okay, well, can I go into what? Can I say one okay, thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that. one of the things, though, is that if a player is looking for an individual coach or a coach for their team, then that's when that goal, you know, what are your goals, that kind of thing happens. I don't think – you just like walk around and start giving advice to people who don't want yeah. like while you're while they're playing you know if they if they just want to play and never have any instruction then they're not going to take clinics or lessons or that kind of stuff and so i feel like there's that's people, what you're maybe saying maybe this is the, where there's kind of disconnect because of where i was last teaching people paid for lessons and didn't want instruction and so uh, it sounds like you're assuming I've that. I've had that too, where you become a, kind of a little bit of a ball machine and they just want to yeah. receive balls. And I think it's a little bit kind of... I don't think I've of, actually ever had that. I've had all kinds of those. And a on the social bit. side and the drilling side. I, have, I love the drilling ones where somebody just kind of wants to tune up before whatever, a tournament or up, the, like. club, uh, yeah. the club I'm championship nice. or whatever. I, I just literally would be like, I if you don't want those. me to teach you... I, there's plenty of times where I've been like, if you mm. don't want me to teach you, then don't be on my court. And I think to talk about that, it's like a lot that, about though. personality. I think as you become a coach and you've coached some more for a while, you develop a reputa reputation for certain areas of focus. Like... Um, I feel like Megan was always really good with like really big groups where you could have like a group of men or a group of women and you could get them to, as a group to get better and blah, 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 or with juniors and stuff. I was a very, like, I, I felt like people know, knew me as like a very technical person. Like adults would come to me and say, Hey, I heard you do really good job with the one handed back. end, so I want to take a one handed back end mm -hmm. lesson. They didn't necessarily come to me for like group drills. I had a group of ladies that were like, somehow it was like, you do a great job, but here's the thing. They wanted um, usually like a tune-up for a league, and they would come to me, which I really enjoyed, probably like um, three months before their league started, and said, we want to get better as a group. We like the way I used to teach them doubles. We like the way you specifically teach doubles, and they gave me the leeway of teaching them very specifically and working on stuff very specifically the way I felt comfortable doing it. Mm -hmm. And they, which I really love, they guarded the group to make sure whoever came with them was like, we're gonna do it his way. And I really enjoy that. But on the, the bigger side of, let's say, social, let's say, um, groups, I was just like, uh, I'm not the type of guy who's gonna be like, okay. Yeah. You know, so a lot, I didn't get a lot of those, those requests. And I was actually felt really uncomfortable sometimes even taking those because I was like, I don't know if I can actually deliver on what you want. And it wasn't so much that I didn't want to do it, but I was like, I was nervous. And she, I mean, Megan would tell you, I was like, oh, God. Yeah, and I would cover. Yeah, I would like, oh, God, I, I don't want to do it. Not because it was like, it was a little bit of not being comfortable, but I just didn't want to deliver and have them have a bad experience. Well, and I did my drills very different than I think <laughs> a lot of other people did in the sense of every drill had one specific focus like of the day so if we were working on one specific like shot for the whole hour that we did and every drill around it was surrounded by that one specific shot so it was very like a 
it wasn't like a, okay, we're just going to play kind of thing. Like mm-hmm. I was like, okay, we're going to work on taking a forehand volley out of the air. And so for an hour, every single game drill, everything we did was that one specific shot. And we'd work on technique and then we'd work on games. And then we, so it was very different than probably a lot of drills. Yeah. I feel like, and I don't sense. know, hearing a little bit of your experiences you had, it sounds like more of the, like, um, go out with someone. It's like, okay, I want to kind of, you run me around and tune me up. Uh, and I don't know, you tell us. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we should move. Okay. I think we should move on instead of having me complain about other students. Oh, no. yes. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Uh, but yeah, I got to the point where the, um, after, you know, five, six years at the same club where, uh, most of those types of lessons had tried me once and they knew it wasn't a good fit. Yeah. And that was great. You yeah. Know, just yeah. to move them off my, oh, yeah, off sure. my schedule. Um, okay. Wh- which direction do you guys th- think we should go in next? What people should look for in a coach or what bothers uh, us the most when we see it during a lesson? I think we should go into what bothers yeah. us the <laughs> most, <laughs> but put it like a three minute time limit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll kick it off. I think, and this is kind of a, kind of a no brainer. And yet I know it happens constantly and it doesn't even have anything to do with coaching per se, but any kind of like phone, like checking for me, uh, there's, there's, <laughs> this is just my, you know, preference. I don't think a coach should ever sit down in the middle of a lesson. I don't think a coach should ever check their phone in the middle of a lesson. Things like that is just for me, just kind of basic like respect and like being present. And, but I see that from like high level, like no, like notable like coaches all the time. And it really kind of makes me sad. Mine is, I always hate when you hear the coach, like switch it, like that joke we did for you on your Facebook, like where you go, okay, now reach up. Okay. Now do this. Okay. Now do this. But that's like every other lesson. (laughs) Like that. It's not though. There's a lot of play, but I think that when there's no focus, like at all, at least like one or two things. Like if you literally are trying to help someone to serve and you tell them 9,000 things, that that was always my like bothersome thing. We're gonna do the the thing with Tyler. I feel like you're you're high on coaches and I'm low on coaches and the reality is probably somewhere in between. (laughs) I might be in the middle. I think there's way more bad lessons being taught than, than you think. Yeah, we were in a very specific environment prep so it was probably yeah, a Tulsa. little different. <laughs> There's a whole rest of the world. Of no, like- I mean like just in the high performance group because yeah, yeah, we yeah, were yeah. around that. But I mean, it was just. Yeah. As soon as you, uh, you as soon as you define it as high performance, like right. everybody knows like kind of why they're there. But I, there's a lot yeah, of bad but, high performance yeah, lessons too. But I would that, say this. There's a lot of that. Like if I'm teaching Kevin and I'm like, okay, reach up. Okay, now it's your toss. Okay, now it's your serve. Okay, yeah. now it's this. Now yeah. it's that. Now it's that. I think other one other probably skewed thing is that since we taught a lot of high performance performance kids, a lot of the adults, the parents came to us for also mm-hmm. the group lessons. So they, I feel like, had some sense of like, okay you know, my kid's getting better. I want to get better. And so they were maybe a little bit more apt, but I've also taught an environment of where, um, a country club, um, and I was introducing more kind of specific things like, okay, how to do this and how to do that. But there was this, it's just, again, I think it comes back to defining what, what the, the person wants. So for me, I would say my biggest thing is when the lesson, <laughs> God, I don't if I say this, my call, uh, <laughs> <laughs> when the person giving the lesson literally is saying the same exact thing over and over again, like it's almost like they're not even watching lessons. Like, okay, Good. you do that. Good. And it's like, literally it's like the same thing. Like, you, you are, could, are you, do you mean from lesson to lesson to lesson or you mean like in the, the same, same lesson? Student, same like, lesson, yeah, it's like the same, the same drill. It's like, it's like the same thing. And it's like, are you even looking at them? It's like, <laughs> Yeah, that drives it's me like nuts. It's like when the when the pro goes good, good, yeah, good, yeah. and the the person's like hitting the fence and then hitting the net. Yeah. But it's it's without awareness because I can see like we say good when somebody hits the fence or something, but we also explain that there's a specific purpose. We're working on a process, not the result. But it's literally like, and you're like. 
Are you, and the are next you, student comes out. Yeah. And it's the same thing the whole hour. Yeah. <laughs> totally. It's, just like, it's just like a factory line. It's like when they go, okay, forehand. Okay, backhand. Okay, short ball. Okay, volley. Okay, volley. Okay, overhead. Next. Okay, yeah. forehand. Okay, backhand. Okay. It's, yeah. making, it's making me <laughs> die, <laughs> die inside. That drives me. In. There's yeah. no instruction. There's no like... Yeah. I get sometimes you have to do that, but yeah, again, when you, to be clear, some, that's exactly yeah, what some people want. I get that, but it's like literally when you go by a month of watching the same person give the same lesson, it's yeah, like yeah, it's that's like one painful. lady walks out and the next lady walks in, it's like okay, <laughs> okay, okay, and it's drilled. I'm gonna pay Kevin so. just to hear him do that yeah, for an hour. That's, that's painful. Yeah. <laughs> So that would be my pet peeve. Yeah, and the one nice thing is like once you're at a club for a long time, like if you're a coach listening to this and you just started coaching, <laughs> like you kind of have to find your groove. You can't be super no. selective. But once you're at a club for a long time, you can be selective. Like I would plenty of times go, uh, like Kevin would see me go, I'd go, they'd say, Megan, I really want a lesson. I'm like, no, you no, don't. You don't. <laughs> I literally would just look at them and say, no, you don't, no. because I am not the coach for you. I'm not going to go out there and not teach you. You're going to get better while you're on my court. And if you don't, then I felt like that was I don't have me. that personality, but I would make it clear during the lesson that <laughs> this is not a good fit. Yeah. And I think that that's the same thing, I think, where in our environment that we came, we worked there for so long. Next we developed show up on the schedule. <laughs> reputations for certain things. Even like I would have juniors where I was like, you, you don't want a lesson for me. Yeah. And then I would kind of do what you're doing. I would absolutely wreck them on the first lesson. Cause I kind of saying like, look, if you want a lesson with me, you're going to get better. These are the standards. If you really want to get good. And I, I mean, I have one kid where literally I ran him side to side for the full hour yeah, he did. and he Poor like cried <laughs> every lesson, <laughs> not every, every lesson, but I mean, there, there was lesson. a moment where I knew he was a little, at the point he was a little soft and he like would kind of fake roll his ankle and like, I can't go. I'm like, if you don't every get lesson. up, if you don't get up and run and he was just, but after a while he actually got better and he was like, this is the standard. And I'd have some kids that go like, I don't want any piece of that. So they knew it's perfect. Yeah. And so As I kind of, that was my, my kind of like, Gatekeeper. I, I think all three of us are in the idea, though, that if you walk on a court with us, we want you to get better. We're, none of us are like yeah. want to just like hang out with BS. you. There are yeah. plenty of times where I would have like a lady or two that would come out, and I would say, "Do you want to go have coffee instead of have a lesson?" Because I was not in the mode to just like feed balls and be like, whatever. Talk I, about their husband. Yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> so I would say like, and the, there was plenty of women that would take me up on it. Like we'd go have coffee instead or go upstairs or do something else. And so I think that, but I, I would hope that every coach wants their student to get better. But I think here's the thing for me. But that's it, us. Yeah. You know, that's what we, that's what we would hope. One thing is I think on coaches' sides, in the beginning, some of them don't know how to get there. Cause I remember that struggle of like, how do you act? I was curious, like how do you change something when someone has a bad habit? And I was like, that took a long time. And to say, I'm talking about the end of the point where it's like, we could be selective in the beginning. It was like, literally like I yeah, would take anyone and everyone like, you, you have a racket and you want to learn. It's like, you have to develop that and go through those times of maybe teaching a lot of lessons where people want to have fun and you find that one person and then you make that person um, better because I think a lot of where at least my standpoint it was word of mouth I was mm -hmm. in the beginning I was like I was just trying to get everybody in and then I do the best I could and it was literally like more people that got better were like oh Kevin got me better at this and the people were like uh Kevin and I didn't have that much fun with Kevin what kind of shake out and but I think it's in the beginning you do have to do a lot of lessons that are maybe what you don't want to get to the point where you could be selective where you know, in after a while, we were really lucky to be like super selective about the adults and the, the kids and have those really candid conversations of like, you don't want me to teach you. All right, let's move on. What should people look for in a coach? Ooh. So we've talked about some of our like pet peeves. What, what are the traits that, and I, on the essential tennis podcast, it's kind of nice because I can very safely assume like exactly who's listening. I feel like this audience might Possibly, it probably is uh, different. Like, not everybody is super like hardcore on that one uh, kind of path of like. I think you described it really well. Like being willing to take a couple of steps back before going forwards. Not everybody's open to that. So, I'll start with one, and we can kind of go around the table. I think some. Just to go back to the pet peeves again, I think some of the worst coaches are the ones that just don't listen. 
and like their student is is trying to show them or tell them that this is not working for me or this is not what I wanted or there's a clear like personality like mismatch and a lot of coaches are just not very empathetic um, even within even if the student and the coach are there for the same reason uh, if the coach isn't really paying attention to signals being given by the student then the student can sometimes be taken in a direction that's that's just not at all really what they wanted I'm being a little bit vague but I think you should look for a coach that listens just as well as they talk. And there's a lot of tennis coaches out there that are tremendous talkers, but uh, don't necessarily listen very well. Um, so I'll, I'll start with that. I think um, having a coach that's willing to talk about where you want to be in the future, like your goals, is really important. Um, not only does it hold the student accountable, but it holds the coach accountable. Like if you are with the same coach week in, week out for six months and you don't see any of the goals that you guys said that you wanted to achieve, then you need to find a new coach. <laughs> like that's just, and I always was really big upon that because not only did it hold my student like, okay, this is what we said is we're going to do, but it also held me accountable to say, okay, every time we step on the court, we're going to work on something specific to put you towards that goal. Um, and so there wasn't any inkling that I just wanted to go out and like hit balls for a day. Every single day had to be focused because I had the same goals as they did. So I felt like that. And I, I feel like, a, sorry, oh, sorry, I feel like, um, a coach, there are plenty of coaches who don't want to take the time to go over goals, and I feel like that's kind of a red flag for me. Hmm. I guess I'm going to start off a little differently. I think what makes what helps make a good coach is making sure you understand first what you want. Because if you're expecting, like if we just give you, at least in my opinion, a definition of what makes a good coach by our perspective, I think I will at least listen to us. We're talking about how do you get better specifically at tennis technique or something like that. So I think, first of all, it's really understanding what you want from the coach and then figuring out what's the criteria that makes you feel good. So I feel like, you know, Ian, you're talking about listening. I think that's tremendous that most coaches don't understand body language or <laughs> Or Eye subtle rolls. hints, yeah. <laughs> body language is huge as a coach when you, you're doing something. You can just see the like the awkward, the the body totally, hanging down, totally. and like the silence, yeah, yeah. and this like you like, don't feel energy, horrible. energy, yeah, and you're like totally Ooh. see that so much. Yeah, a lot of coaches don't feel that. Um, I think like Megan, you're talking about goal setting. Great when players really want to get better because I think that accountability to have accountability with your coach is huge. I, I used to do the same thing as saying, give me. 30 days. Like if you check back with me in 30 days and we haven't made some sort of progress that I promised you, then you need to literally, I'll tell them you need to get rid of me. Or, um, I think another thing is having a coach and I'm speaking from the realm of getting better technically stuff like that. Um, having a coach is willing to say either let's try something different. Um, I learned something different and I want to work with you and see if this will work with you. Because I think some coaches get embarrassed when, Maybe they, they, they learned something new and they've went down this route of the old ways so long that they can't go like, hey, maybe I was wrong about that and we need to try something just different. And so what happens point. is uh, they've invested so much in the old way that they can't change to something new and they're like embarrassed to say like, yeah, maybe this way I was teaching it, it didn't work as well, let's try something. So I personally... You know, I think a lot of coaches either go to a conference and they see something done new and they're like, I can't go back and say that because that completely contradicts what I've been showing this person. But I think the student really appreciates it because I'm like, oh, OK, well, you're you're actually trying to do something different to get me the result compared to maybe just bum, 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 Oh, you're not better. OK. Bum, 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 bum. So that's my kind of thing. I think you look for a coach if you're trying to get better. Um, as someone who's willing to try different things and say, oh, yeah, so-and-so was doing this. Maybe I'll try it with a purpose to, to improve. I'll just uh, kind of piggyback off that a little bit. and It's, it's kind of a subtopic of the same uh, element, and that is um, – I don't remember how many modalities there are. I've learned. It's either three or four. Uh, kinesthetic, uh, visual, five. auditory – it's five. VAK is the first three, and then you have uh, olfactory and um, what's that? Ooh, 
gustatory and olfactory. I can't remember exactly. Yeah, well, one of them smell, up. and the other smell. one, yeah, smell is I a know huge smell is one. Yeah, a modality. If you, it's like if you smell something, it brings back a memory. Yeah. Um, I can't remember can't what smell. The, uh, I remember those backhand <laughs> yeah. smells down the line. They smell pretty. So anyway, uh, most, a lot of coaches have like a particular modality that they're most comfortable with. Mm. And it's the, it's the path that they take to try to get their students to understand something. And when that modality doesn't work, a lot of coaches, a lot of times will kind of have the, the attitude or the stance like, well, you just must not get it. <laughs> so true. And it's like, mm-hmm. I, have a great I story explain it. Like, I, I don't just can't explain it any better than that. Like, this is the way you're supposed to do it. You're not doing it. And so I guess it's just not a good fit for you. And I, I would say that players should be looking for a coach that can shift modalities and do something that's like they're guiding you kinesthetically and then maybe explain it with a, uh, a different uh, analogy or a visual or something like that, demonstrate it for you. If you're... If you're working with somebody who cannot be uh, plastic and flexible and shift, then the two of you will probably just be frustrated. Yeah, there are so many times where I would be teaching, and I, I've always like, you have to go and like explain it 10 million different ways. And then if I couldn't, then I would always ask like, okay, Kevin, can you come over and explain this? Because maybe what he's saying will help out. And I think a lot of times uh, coaches are unwilling to ask other coaches for help. Totally. Yeah. Uh, because they're like, I just, there's You're that. supposed to be the, the man or right. the, the woman. You're supposed right. to be the expert. Yeah. And, and I feel like, like you can always learn as a coach from all the other coaches out there whether it's good or bad, <laughs> you can learn from them. And so there's if you're, there's a new way how not to do yeah, it. <laughs> it. Yeah, exactly. And there's a plenty of those times, but there's, you know, I think we kind of get into these bubbles to where it's like, um, you, you your know, pet, your, your clients way. are your, are your livelihood. And so you feel like if you ask another coach for their advice, then they're going to steal your player and, you know, and all of that, the politics goes into play oh, instead of actually politics. just trying to help the student the best way you possibly can. And I think that's the kind of coach you want is the coach that's going to try to help you more than make themselves look good or anything else. They're, they're doing research and, and trying to learn themselves to make you a better player rather than just saying, well, what I, uh, what I know is God. This is the way it is. Yeah, no, exactly. No. I totally agree with that. I like, there's a saying, uh, what's his name? He used to speak, uh, teach a lot of language, like he was a language guy. Um, but anyway, he had this thing about like, it was the teacher's job to teach, not the kind of student's job to in a sense learn i'm butchering it and what he was he was like he would teach people how to learn a language basically he had it where he could teach you how to learn where you could have basic conversational language in like a week and everybody's like that's not possible but he would teach you and he was like i don't want you the rules he would say is i don't want you to worry about remembering i don't want you to worry about um um like writing stuff down you're not take to take notes and you're not to practice when you're at home and people are like, that doesn't make, yeah, you both are smiling like, there's no way it's going to work. But the whole idea was to take the pressure off of learning for them. And that, like you're saying, and it was like he would try different modalities of learning um, and be very aware of it. Uh, I remember a really quick story. I had this lady who I loved to death who um, I would teach her and she would give me like this blank face, like literally blank face. Mm -hmm. And I was actually reading on modalities and we're talking about like matching their modality. And I recognized that she talked very slow. (laughs) And so it was always trippy because I started talking very slow. Like I would literally go from this speed and go, so this is what I want. And she lit up yeah, every, like yeah. Ten, Megan was like, I was horrible. I did not catch on to it. I gave the same person lessons and was like, I can't get through. I don't know why. And so I, I told Kevin, maybe you should try to give her lessons. And totally. I realized that she, just the way she processed information was so much slower. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and so I just talked like that. And she was like, no one's ever yeah. told me and this And she got before. better. Like, so this much is amazing. Quicker. And I re- would sometimes forget and go to like, oh, she's like, this doesn't make sense. And I was like, oh, sorry. OK, well, and yeah, so it's very I think you're totally dead on right with getting better at you have to you have to understand a little psychology as a tennis coach, because a lot of it is 
I would say 90% of it is communication and how you communicate different ideas through different modalities. Mm -hmm. And knowing your strengths and weaknesses as a player and as a coach. I, I like one question I always asked a student, like if I was very uh, first time and I did this the other day, actually, when we were in Hawaii, um, I said, okay, do you learn visually? Like, do you like to mm. see things or do you like to hear things? Like, how do you best learn? And most adults kind of already know, um, some of them, I don't know how many percentage wise, but there's quite a few. And she was like, I am very visual. And as soon as I was like, okay. So then I started showing her and then it was like, oh, she got it rather than me explaining it. Or very literal people. I love literal mm -hmm. people. How do you change coaches? <gasps> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I feel like there's so much anxiety about this and totally understandable. Uh, politics got brought up a, a minute ago. And in a club environment, in particular a private, you know, club environment, there's so much. There's just the social circles and, mm -hmm. oh, man. Uh, yes. yeah. Trying to navigate that is super intimidating. And so you add into the mix, you're like, in a lot of cases, coaches who have been there for like 10, 20, 30 years. And there's only like so many choices you have and you don't necessarily want to like burn any bridges. Um, but I, I guess I'll just kick this off by just simply saying that Hopefully over the last, like, I don't know how long we've been talking, 45 minutes or whatever, hopefully it's become somewhat apparent to those of you listening that there's a lot of different facets to this whole, like, lesson thing. There's, like, I don't know how many, probably seven or eight different motivating factors that a player might have. There's a whole lot of ways to give a, a bad lesson as a coach. And so hopefully that kind of empowers some of you listening to a certain extent to just understand that like the one, a, a coach is not going to be the, the right fit, like for everybody. And it's okay. I think it's just totally like part of the process to uh, find out and then moving on is, is just kind of, and your goals might change too for people listening. Like you might start off in one of those camps that we talked about earlier on and then slowly shift more towards social or more towards uh, being hardcore like technique. And so as, you're, as you evolve as a player, then it's only natural that I think the, the coaches uh, that you spend time with and spend money with should probably shift as well. So Thoughts how on how to navigate that? that? I think it, yeah. I mean, I, I have a specific way that I think I would want. I would want a student to just be honest yeah. and, and just be like, you know, I, I've i shifted you know, a little bit in like what I want to get out of like tennis. And right now, um, it's it's not a good fit. I would I would appreciate just having a, a quick conversation instead of like the behind uh, yeah. closed doors like drama. I think that's the big thing. And I think that, there were plenty of times that, you know, um, players and, and myself did not, were not a good fit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there were plenty of times where I was the one too, that was like, I am just not the right fit for you. I'm going to find you another coach that is a better fit. And so I feel like if the student would come up and say, Hey, you know, like I just, I'm, I'm thinking about trying other coaches. That's, I don't think it needs to be anything like dramatic, yeah. anything crazy. I think where it gets dramatic <laughs> is where they go like to another coach and then they're like, Hey, I want to switch to you. And then the coach is like trying to go behind the other coaches back and trying to like maneuver lessons. When the student told the first coach already or not? Yeah. But, but did, did, no one told you. Okay, so so no one there told wasn't the any first, yeah, and okay. then the other yeah. student, and so instead yeah, yeah, yeah. of the other coach coming to you, uh, uh, yeah. like that's happened to uh, to us too. I mean, you'll have a student come up to you and be like, "I really want to take lessons from you and not from this coach," but instead of being like, "Okay, great," like you, what we what I would do is go up to the other coach and say, "Hey." This student approached me. I'd like you to talk to them and see where you guys want to meet before I ever get yeah. involved. And then if you feel like it's best that I give them lessons, I'm totally there. If no. you feel like it's best that you guys stick it out, I'm totally going to support you 100%. And so that... I feel like it, that doesn't happen pretty much. Well, well go ahead, it I'm does <laughs> if... I think it's, I mean, that's the way I always did it. And I, and I, I felt, there were plenty of times where I felt hurt when coaches would come in and just say hey you need to take lessons from me and I think that is not something that's that that 
pisses me off. Oh, we got it the, does. The piss off. Like if you know, if Kevin's giving someone a lesson, I I don't feel like I'm a good coach if I go to that student and say you need to take lessons yeah, from me because dirty. I can do Kevin's blah not blah blah. You the dirty, real way, right? Dirty, yeah. dirty. And but that's what happens so yeah. often. And I feel like you just need to have communication between you and your coach. And if you feel like you can't walk up to them and say hey, today was a really bad lesson. Like, I don't think it was really good. Then I feel like you need to either have better communication with them or find someone that you can. Yeah, I agree. I would say um, there's so many different facets and different levels of it. From the student side, I think, first of all, I would assume most coaches do appreciate the student coming up and saying, you know, uh, I really enjoy blah, blah, blah. You, we can go, we can send out a script later. But basically, uh, I want to try something different. I want to go in a different direction. Um, nothing's wrong with you. It's totally me. It's the breakup speech. Um, George Costanza. Yeah, you, you got to do the breakup speech. Um, I totally agree with Megan, too. Like, if, and for this to happen, there has to be some level of. Um, community or something, I don't know the right word, between other coaches at your facility. Because, yeah, a lot of coaches on the background... Rapport. Rapport, yeah. Uh, Because on the background, coaches look at other students as like, okay, more... Dollar signs. Yeah, dollar signs. (laughs) Or they kind of like, oh, I can do a better job than that person. So, and they're... And when it's in that sense, it gets kind of dirty. But yeah, I definitely have had a situation where players have come to me and said, hey, I would love to work with you. I'm like, well, I know you're working with so-and-so, why don't you talk to him or I could talk to him first, but we're not going to have any sort of kind of lesson or plan before we first, um, like figure out your, your initial relationship with your first coach on the other side, on the flip side, I think it is hard for a lot of players to go up to their coach and say, Hey, that was a crappy lesson today. Um, unless they're like, I don't know. Have you, has, has anybody ever had like a student come up to you and say, I don't think it's ever happened to me, <laughs> which to be honest, I probably have given a crappy lesson out. So it makes me more apt to either the student doesn't realize maybe they've had a, a lesson that wasn't the best, maybe cause I was tired or something. Um, I feel like I've always I tried just, to give I just my don't best think players think that they're, in a position where they can. Yeah. And that's the other thing I was going to say. It's, I, it's like you got your coach student yeah, relationship and, and that's what I was going to hint to. The next thing is like, I think a lot of players walk into this coach relationship of coach's authority. I'm supposed to yeah. listen. It's just like just the, do, the do social, socialization of school, like teacher, student. And so there's this, I think you have to develop that relationship of having, having really candid conversations with your coach. Like if, if you're in the improvement route, like if you're just out there to have fun, let the guy do whatever he does that make you have fun. But if you're in the improvement route, you need to be able to say, okay, um, you know, I don't feel like we're moving in the direction I want to. But when you say that, I think, cause some people just say that for saying it, like have some evidence. Like I used to, I love this student, um, I won't say her name, but loved her students. She used to document like every lesson or every mm-hmm. drill of what went wrong. And she would come up to a coach and go, okay, I'm not, I've, I've done this. I've improved this. These are the players I've been with and this I'm not. And she would, she would literally have a documentation of everything. And you're like, oh, wow, you're totally right. If you're a good coach, you respect that tremendously. Yeah, and it's I did. so rare. It's, in a, yeah, in a and I totally did. And I was like, you're totally right. We need to fix this. Compared to some students, like, well, I feel like, you know, my forehand, and they have no kind of, it's just like a, like, you know, I it's should be, criticism. Yeah, like, it's a random my criticism. My should be twice as good It should be twice as better. I've had two <laughs> lessons, and my, my, my take back is, you know, like, okay, really? And so I think that's important because then you get the students to become coach jumpers. They're like, okay, I'm going to yeah. take two lessons from Ian, yeah, do totally. Ian, my forehand, Megan, Ian didn't fix my forehand, and like, I don't know why. But But that goes to the coaches that say, I'll fix your backhand in 30 minutes. Like that's, there's so many coaches that say that. I think there's coaches and students and students that are like student student jumpers. And then they 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 come back to you and you're like, well, uh, let's start over with that forehand again. Like, uh, really? You're just a coach jumper. So I think there's two sides of coaches not being the person to initiate that like, coach jumping and the student realizing that it does take time to fix things, but you need to have a coach like Megan was saying that's going to hold themselves accountable and you accountable and check in with goals and, okay, we've done this drill, we've done this, and this is the reason why, see the results. I think those things have to be sort of tracked uh, to a certain level so you can have, like, um, not ammunition, but 
I'm, I'm blanking on words today. They're just aggressive words. But you can have some sort of evidence to why you're making certain claims. Yeah. Or are you just going to jump to another coach, to another coach, to another coach? <laughs> I had to do it. Sorry. Any other uh, thoughts, Megan, how to change coaches? I, I think that's a pretty good no, I think it's good. good. Overview, I think it's good just specifics. like a respect thing. Just as if you were the CEO of a company and you're going to fire someone for certain reasons, like you don't just go behind their back and hire someone else. And then in the end, like they, yeah. you know what I mean? Like you, you hmm. go to them and you say like, this is the reasons why this is what's going on. It's just, I feel like the more direct and I feel like, I guess it's personality. I'm very direct. So <laughs> I like people being very direct towards me. Um, so maybe that's just me. I don't know. I think it's, it's just human nature. I think it's, in, in the way I say that, it's like having, a, it's a relationship. You have a relationship. You hate being, if you're on the side of a relationship and someone's breaking out with you, you hate looking down your phone and getting a text like, yo, I'm breaking up with you. It's like, have the courtesy to talk to me in person. Or like, you find out from some other dude that your yeah. girl's dating some other, it's like, hold up, I thought we were together. And she's, come on. That's just wrong. So I think you treat it just like a relationship. Like you would, it sucks. Because don't get me wrong. If a person comes up and says, hey, I want to switch. There is a initial gut punch of like, oh, what did I do wrong? Did I not blah, blah, blah. But I think you as a coach have to also, and it takes a long time, facilitate that change in a great way so you continue to have a great relationship. I had a student, uh, multiple students kind of go, oh, I want to go in a different direction. And I think it was my job, because they came to me, they made that conversation, to continue our relationship as just friends. And I think some coaches, when that switch happens, yeah, they're, they're like, they, they're you, like you're, forget you for life. Yeah, kind you're of like, uh, what's blacklisted? It's like, yeah. mm, I will scorn you for life. It's hard, it too. Is, it is hard. It is like, hard. There are but plenty I've, of kids yeah. that I taught for 10 years yeah. that it's would a relationship. come up to me you know, and be like, hey, I think I'm going to go in another direction. Yeah. And you've invested you know, yeah. 10 years of yeah. your life Adult into someone. Adult or kid. It's a relationship. It's yeah. But you do. You, you want to keep them on. And I think it's really important as a coach because you never know when they might come back or they need your support in a different way that maybe mm -hmm. you can't provide it as a coach to, to be able to do that. As a student, if you have a coach and they're blacklisting you, you probably shouldn't have been with them anyway because they're just that type of coach and you mm -hmm. can't change it. But it, it does hurt. It does hurt sometimes. <laughs> Last thing I'll, I'll, I'll just mention, just for perspective for all the players out there, is uh, I totally agree. Like having that narrow mindset of like, oh, you're not gonna take lessons from me, then F you. <laughs> like is unbelievably like petty and narrow minded. But I think it's important for players to understand that co you're, most coaches are in an environment where if you're, not, if you're not on the court, you're not getting paid. And there's a certain number of courts, a certain number of coaches, a certain number of like members at your club if you're in, in like a membership type environment. And coaches are, it's depending on the personality and their ego and psychology. It's not, it's not hard for a coach to go down that route of like, I'm going to like protect my students and screw that guy and he's wrong and I'm right. And like, I'm the, I'm the one you should really be listening to. And, um, and poaching, I'll show you the true way. Yeah. Poaching students from other coaches. Like all of that happens because uh, coaches very are under a lot of pressure to maintain their, their clientele, uh, to maintain their hours on the court. Um, and so it can be tough. And this is why the communication that Megan and Kevin are talking about is so critical. Um, cause if you don't kind of realize the environment that they're in and respect it, then it can, it can feel crappy on the other side too. Yeah, I think environment's so tough because I... It's cutthroat. It, it is, is cutthroat. It, tennis but it's not, world is, t is tough. There's a, there's a lot of... It's both. and Because I, I don't want to make us paint this like dark picture that the coaching world is such like the dark alley. Club the club, throat. it can be... Club the club, it is different. But different. I, I think it does depend on the manager and how they deal with it uh, as yeah. a group, pros together. Um, but yeah, and you just get different motivations. Some pros are super motivated by... Uh, the dollar sign. Some pros are super motivated by like having the best players to do the best. And so you get different environments that cause different things. But I definitely think you have, there are a lot of good pros out there and there are a lot of bad pros out there. And it's really figuring out for me, my ending statement is like, what do you want? Not that you want a bad pro, but what kind of lesson do you want? And really 
being open to asking a lot of questions, not putting yourself in the position of like the lowly student who has, you have no choices. You have tons of choices. And I think you should hold your coach accountable on an equal level as you, where you don't get stuck in this situation where you're just like either getting bad lessons or you're not getting what you want. But don't be a coach jumper. There's a, there's a fine line between <laughs> being a coach jumper and... Should be another um, shank cast. Yeah. Is, Are you a coach jumper? Well, I think the other thing is, is that nobody's making millions of dollars coaching tennis. And so the people who are actually coaches want to coach. Like they like tennis. They want to help people get better. I don't feel like there's a lot of tennis coaches out there that like just legitimately don't want to make people better. Do you really think there are? I think there no. are some kind of, yeah, I actually think there so are some people teaching cause they were whatever, a college player and they're, they didn't finish their degree and it's yeah. like, there's it's, a lot of, it's a job. Really don't it's like a job. I, there it's a job, are yeah. some guys that are like some, you know, people out there are just like, I just want a buck. Hey, I'll feed you a couple balls. You pay me. We're good. A year and later, they yeah, got a full uh, schedule, yeah. and it's like, all right, yeah, I guess well, this is what I'm doing. Yeah, I yeah, do there's all think there's coaches. all kinds <laughs> of coaches it. out there. I don't think that every coach has the pure motivation of wanting well, to make a Well, you should find a coach yeah. right now if you're Just listening like school that teachers, wants to. You know, school teachers, unbelievable people, you know, on average. But there's some people that go into it because it's like, it's a job. Like, it's a career. Um, and it, it is what it is. Yeah. That makes me sad. All right. Good finishing note there. <laughs> <laughs> Any final, uh, final, I, I like your uh, re-emphasis, Kevin, of the different strokes for different folks. I think for me, that that's kind of maybe, for me personally, the most important thing that everybody needs to be aware of. They need to be aware of their own self-motivation, their own goals, and then find a coach that, that matches up as ideally as possible with, uh, with those things. Any final thoughts, Megan? Goals. Figure yeah. out what your goals Hashtag are. goals. Find a coach that's willing to help you figure out a way to reach those goals. Yeah, I would just read. It sounds like so. it should be that simple, but it, I mean, <laughs> it, I do honestly believe it is that it might take a little while to find that coach and to yeah. figure out. But there's, I honestly, and maybe I'm just biased. I honestly believe that most coaches want you to get better, and maybe this. I'm, I'm just doing nicer. The Tyler tour. We're doing the Tyler tour. <laughs> Um, but I just feel like, yeah, I just feel like <laughs> it's tour. the way that most coaches want. You're Anyways, show up at a town and oh people like gosh. Tyler, who is Tyler? Oh, oh no. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I totally, I'm just going to reiterate that. It's about figuring out a, what personality, what kind of lesson you want, be having those goals around that lesson and, uh, uh, finding, a coach who matches your, not only you just your goals, but your personality, your energy level. You know, if you're getting super excited about learning something new and your coach is on the other side, like, oh yeah, that's great. Uh, that's just not a great match. And you want to find somebody who matches your enthusiasm, your level of energy about whatever type of goals you have. If you're the rah, rah, you want somebody rah, rah on the other side having fun with. So, um, that's it. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed. As Thank always, you. if you have any suggestions for topics, shoot us an email to support at EssentialTennis.com. And we'll catch you next time. We're out. ETF.